Hi and welcome back. Today we're going to start rotations or rotational motion of a rigid body. You might think we did rotational motion already but we did it in the context of point masses. Today we're going to start our study of extended bodies and uh, we're going to focus on rigid bodies. So what is a rigid body? A rigid body is a body that maintains distance between, if you take any two points within the rigid body, the distance between those two points will remain constant, meaning they don't get closer to each other or farther from each other. For example, let me show you here. Here's a typical uh, something, a rigid body that uh, turns around. And uh, points within here, they don't get close or far from each other. Of, of, of course, I mean, nothing is perfectly rigid. You can bend anything. But here is something that's not rigid. This is not rigid because if you take this point and this point, I could easily make them close to each other. But for uh, here, within uh, uh, this piece of metal here, I, I cannot make them closer. I mean, of course, I could bend it and use a lot of force, but it's approximately rigid. And we're going to focus on rigid bodies turning about a fixed axis here uh, through the what's called the center of mass. So what is the center of mass and how do we define it? That's what I'm going to devote this segment to and, uh, and then we will continue. So the center of mass of an object, uh, if you have a collection of objects, so let's say you have, uh, here is the x, y plane, x and y, so let's say I have a point mass here, and a point mass here, and a point mass here, and another point mass maybe here. So this mass M1 would have coordinates x1 and x2, uh, not x2, I'm sorry, x1 and y1. And let's say this is mass 2, would have coordinates x2 and y2, and mass 3. Uh, can have coordinates of uh, x3 and y3 and mass 4. And of course, you can have as many as you like. For an extended body, you would have infinitely many of them. Uh, approximately infinitely many of them. Uh, x4 and y4. So where is the center of mass? By definition, it's defined this way. x, the position, the x coordinate of the center of mass will equal to m1, x1, the x-coordinate of m1, and we will do a calculation in a moment, uh, plus m2, x2, plus m3, x3, plus dot, 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 dot. You could have 4, 5, 10, 100 of them. Uh, it doesn't matter. Divided by the total mass, m1, plus m2, plus m3, plus dot, dot, dot. Brief, uh, the abbreviation, we could write it this way, or shorthand, we use summation notation. The summation from i equal to 1 to capital N. Let's say if I have 100 of them, i goes from 1 to 100. You can't write 100. I mean, you could, but it would take you a while. But it's easier to just try to use the notation. Sum from i 1 to n of mi and xi divided by the sum of the masses, which is just the total mass. Capital M stands for M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M4 and so on. Similarly, the Y coordinate of the center of mass will be M1, Y1 plus M2, Y2 plus M3, Y3 and so on, divided by M1 plus M2 plus dot, dot, dot. In a moment, I will tell you why the center of mass is defined the way it is, but let's focus on that a little bit later. And why center of mass, if I use the summation notation, will be the sum over mi, yi, divided by the total, total mass, and i is equal to 1 to capital M. So uh, let's do an example just in two dimensions, uh, uh, in, uh, in one dimension. Let's say, uh, or actually, let's do an example in two dimensions and then I will come back and do one in, in two dimensions. Yeah, and then uh, in, in one dimension. I will do the two dimensions first. So let's say here is the x axis and here is the y axis. 
one, two, three, four, all right, one, two, three, four, uh, let's say here, one, two, three, and then minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, all right, and then on here I have uh, minus one, minus two, uh, let's say minus three, uh, minus four. Okay, let us take our uh, point masses. Let's say I have M1 here. That's where M1 is. This is M1. And, uh, and then I will give you the masses themselves, how much they are. And let's say M2 is here. That's M2. And let's say M3 is somewhere here. M3. And uh, let's take M4 to be, uh, well, let's take it here. That's M4. M4. And let us take M1 to equal to 2 kilograms. M2, uh, let's say M1 is 1 kilogram, M2 is 2 kilograms, M3 is 3 kilograms, and M4 is 4 kilograms. I think that's easy. All right, let's calculate the center of mass. So x center of mass would be m1, x1 plus m2, x2 plus m3, x3 divided by the total mass. First of all, the total mass would be one kilogram, would be m1, which is one, plus m2, which is two, plus m3, which is three, plus m4, which is four. And then uh, m1, x1, m1 is one kilogram, What's the x position, the x coordinate of m1? Well, m1 is at the origin, that's the point zero, zero, so x is zero, so zero. Plus m2, that's two kilograms, times the x coordinate of m2. m2 is here, that's the x coordinate of m2 is four, so four uh, times, uh, plus m3 times the x coordinate of m3. M3 is three kilograms, and the x coordinate of M3 is two, right? The x coordinate is two. So three kilograms times two, and then uh, four, four. M4 is four kilograms, and the x coordinate of M4 is minus four. Minus four. And, uh, well, we will do a, uh, a calculation here. Uh, you have what? Zero, and then you have eight. 8 plus 6, negative 16. So 8 plus 6 is 14, minus 16 is negative 2. So that would be negative 2, and uh, divided by, so it would be negative 2 over what? Um, that's what, 10. Negative 2 over 10, so zero, negative 0 0.2. Negative 0 0.2. That's the x coordinate of the center of mass. How about the y? Uh, y center of mass will be M1, which is 1 kilogram times Y1, plus M2, which is 2 kilograms times Y2, I keep it plain, and then M3, 3 kilograms times Y3, and then plus M4, which is 4 kilograms times the Y coordinate of M4, divided by the total mass, which is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, let me also write it explicitly. And let's see what we get here. The x coordinate of m1, m1 happens to be at the origin, so it's uh, its y coordinate is zero. The y coordinate of m2 is three. The y coordinate of m3 is right here, so that's negative four. The y coordinate of m4 is one. So have one times zero is zero, and six, and minus 12, six plus negative 12, that's uh, negative six, plus four, that's negative two, and negative two over 10 is negative 0.2. Wow, what a coincidence, 0.2. Negative 0.2 and negative 0.2, so where is the center of mass? The center of mass would be right here, right there, somewhere there, okay? And uh, so that's that. Let me do a, 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 another example. Imagine you have like a dumbbell 
and has two masses connected by like a very right, uh, light rod. And uh, here is an example. So let's say uh, I have a dumbbell here. Here is M1 or M2, and here is M1. And uh, I want to know where the center of mass is. So let's say they are separated by, uh, let me just get the example, it's from the book, so I will get the numbers from the book. So imagine this is 0 0.5 meters, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 meters, and this one let's say is 2 kilograms, and this one is 500 grams or 0 0.5 kilograms, and we want to know where the center of mass is. The center of mass is like a weighed average. It's like calculating your GPA. The classes that have the larger number of units, they weigh more, and the GPA would be biased towards them. Same thing here. This mass weighs more than this one, so the center of mass will not be halfway through. It will be somewhere here. And basically, you can think of it as where you would put your finger so that uh, the, uh, the masses would balance. Okay, so how are we going to calculate it? Well, let's set our coordinates. So I'm going to set my coordinates this way. This is x and this is y. So both of them have a y coordinate of 0. And so the I know the center of mass will be here. It will have a y coordinate equal to 0, so it will be along the x-axis. The x coordinate of the center of mass, x, uh, first of all, the y coordinate of the center of mass, we said it is already 0, so it's here. If you have two masses there along the line, then the center of mass would be, would be somewhere between them. And then x center of mass would be m1 x1. m1 is 2 kilograms, and x1 is 0. It's located at the origin. And then uh, this one is 0.5 kilograms, and it's uh, at 0 0.5. The total mass is 2 plus 0 0.5. That's two and a half. So x center of mass will equal to, uh, that's 0 0.25, 0 0.25 over 2.5. If you multiply both, uh, I mean, you could divide, but if I multiply both by 4, I get a 1 here, and I get a 10 here, so that's 0 0.1. So the center of mass will be located at 0 0.1. So if this is 0.5, the center of mass will be somewhere here x center of mass. So now, imagine I have a, they're connected by a rod here, very light, so the mass is here, and these masses are spinning, right? Let's say they are spinning about the, the rod. And let's say they are spinning at an angular, uh, an angular velocity of, uh, let's say, five radians per second, right? Let's say if omega, is equal to uh, 5 radians per second, right? The angular velocity, remember? So they're spinning like this. Imagine you drill a hole, you fix them, you drill a hole here and make like a really frictionless bearing, and, and they're spinning about it. So a little bit later, M1 will be here, and M2 will be somewhere there, and so on. So they're spinning. So the question is, what's the velocity of m1 and what's the velocity of m2. First of all, the angular velocity is the same because both of them are going, when this one turns by one degree, this one also turns by one degree because it's rigid. Uh, so their angular velocity is the same, but their velocities are not the same. Their linear velocities are not the same because this one makes a really uh, a larger circle, whereas this one makes travels over, uh, rotates about a circle of radius. We said this is point 0.1. That's point 0.1. And this one makes a circle of radius point 0.4. So this one is making a circle that's four times the radius. So you would imagine that this one would be traveling at four times the speed. But let's calculate it. V1 would be omega r1, if you remember. Or omega x1, omega r1. And omega is 5, and r1 is 0 0.1. For m1, the distance from here to the point of rotation, the, uh, the center of rotation, is 0 0.1. And that would be 0 0.5 meters per second. And V2 would be uh, omega uh, R2. And that is, omega is 5. 
but this one is 0.4 away from the center of rotation, that is 0 0.4, and that gives me 2 meters per second. And of course, 2 is 4 times uh, 0.5. Okay, so where does the center of mass come from, or why do we even define it this way? By the way, when, it, when we have, uh, this is point masses, but if, it, uh, if we have a continuous distribution of mass, it will be an integral, this summation becomes an integral. The masses will shrink to zero. You have tiny masses. I will come back to this point in a moment, but the sum will become an integral. Of course, in, in physics, the smallest mass you can get would be limited. You can't go to zero. Uh, the unit masses are discrete, but it's approximately an integral. So why do we have the center of mass? So imagine you have two masses here, or three masses, or four, but let's just take there's two masses. Let's say here is M1, and here is M2. Right, M2. M2. I drew them here, and let's say here is my x and y coordinates. Here they are. Here is R1, the position of M1, and here is R2, the position of uh, M2. And R is has x and y coordinates, right? This will be x1, this will be y1, and this will be x2, and this will be y2. Okay. So I know that by Newton's second law, let me apply Newton's second law to the first mass. So the it, it, Newton's second law says the net force on mass 1 will equal to mass 1 times the acceleration of mass 1. And remember the acceleration is the derivative of velocity, and velocity is the derivative of position, so it's the second derivative of position with respect to time. So it's d r1 dt like that. Okay. Now, the net force on m1 can be divided into, in, into the sum of two forces. It will be the force on 1 due to mass 2, because mass 2 could potentially apply a force on mass 1. Maybe they are connected by a spring, or they are pulling, attracting each other gravitationally, or maybe there is an electric force between them. Whatever that force might be, it's the force on 1 due to 2, would be the force on mass 1 due to mass 2, plus the force on 1 due to everything else. So I'll put capital E, meaning everything else. There could be frictional forces, there could be other things applying a force to it. So, so the net force on mass 1 can be divided into two forces, the force on 1 due to mass 2, and then the force on 1 due to everything else. Okay. And then the same thing, the force on mass 2 would be m2 times the sec its own acceleration. Um, and then... Uh, this will be the force on 2 due to 1 plus the force on 2 due to uh, everything else. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to add these two equations. So what's the total force on M1 and M2 combined as a system? Well, that's the total force on them. So the net force on, on our system will be the sum of these two forces. Let's add them. So when you add these and add these, so that's the left side will be M1 dr1 dt squared plus M2 dr2, second derivative of the position 2 with respect to time, equals, let's add them. The force on 1 due to 2 plus the force on 2 due to 1, they just add up to 0 by Newton's third law. So force on 1 due to 2 will be equal to the force on 2 due to 1 with a minus sign. Here's the second law. Uh, sorry, the third law. So these two add up to 0. And the force on 1 uh, plus the force on the force on 1 that's external to 1 plus the force that's external to 2, that's the net force on them, which is what I have on the left side. That's just the net force. This is the force on 1 due to everything else plus the force on 2 due to everything else. The fact that one can apply force on two and two can apply force on one, that's an internal force, and it simply cancels when we consider M1 plus M2 as a system. 
Okay, and we want to study the motion of it. Okay, so, all right. Okay, what does this have to do with uh, the center of mass? Let me box this. This is what we have. The net force on M1 and M2 is equal to the, just the net external force to them, and it's equal to this. So here is how the center of mass was inspired. Let's, let's use the definition of the center of mass. The R, the center of mass, is equal to, remember, it was M1, R1, plus M2, R2, divided by M1, plus M2. Right? Earlier I wrote it as M1, X1, the, that's the X component of the center of mass, of mass was M1, X, uh, X1, plus M2, X2, over the total mass, and the Y component was M1, Y1 plus M2, Y2 divided by the total mass, that's the Y component, but if I combine it in one vector equation, it would look like this. This is the total mass. That's the total mass. I will write it as capital M, and I will multiply capital M on both sides. So I get this. Capital M, total mass, R center of mass, will be equal to M1, R1, plus M2, R2, Let's now take, you see this is starting to look like this. The only thing is I just have to take two derivatives with respect to time on both sides, and then we will get that equation. So it says this. If I take the derivative with respect to time here, it will be the mass times dr of the center of mass dt squared equals to m1 r1, uh, the second derivative r1 dt squared plus m2 second derivative of r2 dt squared but this is equal to the net external force external force so what this says the net external force is simply equal to the mass the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass because this is just the acceleration of the center of mass so it's equal to just the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass all right so so if i have a uh, uh, let me just go back to this board here and let me write this i just have uh, make sure i have enough time yeah i do oh still have some time I have this, the net force, net external force to our system will just be the total mass times the acceleration of this point called the center of mass. So imagine you have two objects here. Here is M2, M1, or yeah, M2, and here is M1. They're applying a force to each other, but that's internal. And you apply an external force to them. And uh, so let's say here's our object, and I throw it, um, throw my object in the air. My object will be rotating, spinning, and so on, and it consists of so many masses. However, there is a point here called the center of mass, and on this eraser, the net external force is that of gravity. And what it says is, if I throw my mass, let's say these two masses, or my eraser, as I throw it, the eraser looks like this. Let's trace the center of mass. It will follow a parabola because the external force is that of gravity, even though the eraser may look like this, I'm sorry, may look like this, and then there, it may be doing really complicated motion, but that center of mass will follow the, the parabolic equation as if it were one point mass with all the mass concentrated at the center of mass. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, if I apply a net external force on two objects, then the center of mass will just act as if the entire mass is at the center, at that, at that point called the center of mass, and it will behave as such. So for example, let me just give you an example here. Let's say the center of mass here is here. And let's say I apply two newtons this way on this force, uh, on this mass. And let me apply two newtons just downward, two newtons upward, two newtons downward. The mass will turn. Right? This one has experienced the force, so it will move. This one has experienced the force, so it will move. But the net external force is equal to zero because I have two newtons upward, two newtons downward. The center of mass itself 
is going to just remain there. It would not even move. It would not even move. Uh, another example is, let's say I have my eraser here, and I drop it from rest. I drop my eraser. And then my eraser somehow, let's say it's, uh, or let's say I have two erasers. Let's say I have two erasers, right, and they're connected by a spring. And here is another eraser connected by a spring. And let's say, uh, and another one, let's say I have three of them. They're connected by, by springs, right? They're connected by springs. And you drop them. And let's say the springs just are time to just open up and uh, let the masses go. So one mass would go this way. The other one would go this way. And the other one might go this way or something. However, the center of mass that's located here, if they're just falling due to gravity, the only external force is that of gravity. The spring forces are internal. The center of mass will simply drop like a rock. Simply drops like as if nothing has happened. Because the only external force is that of gravity, and therefore the center of mass will drop like that. And that's why the center of mass has been defined, and that's why it's important. Okay. How about if you have the center of mass uh, of a, uh, an extended object? Let's have a, an object here, and uh, the object is extended. Here is my object. Here is the x-axis. Here is the y-axis. And let's say my object looks like this. It doesn't consist of one mass. It doesn't consist of 10 masses. It consists of lots of masses, lots of masses. And so we divide it into many masses. So let's call this one, here is M1, here is M2 right next to it maybe, M2, and this is maybe M100, uh, and so on. And we will just take a typical one, uh, or a generic one, we will call it just MI. And it's located here at XI, yi so what's the center of mass of these collection of objects well i have to do the summation of all of them so the the center of mass will equal to the sum from i equal to one to n and then uh, of the mass mi times xi xi and then the y center of mass will equal to, oh, divided by the total mass of sorry total mass which is m1 plus m2 plus m3 and then here, uh, i equal to 1 to n, and then mi, yi, divided by the total mass. Now, I could divide this into as small of masses as I want, but then when I divide them into tiny masses, the number of masses will increase. And if I shrink the number of masses to be really tiny, capital N will increase even further, because the more you divide them, the more of them you have. But their sum will still equal to some total mass. So if I divide the masses into infinitesimal, really tiny, going to zero, then the number here will become infinite. So I'm summing an infinite number of masses that are uh, uh, approaching zero. So this becomes a, uh, the integral of, um, uh, of x times dm divided by the total mass. And this one will become the y component dm divided by the total mass. And you have to have the equation of this thing in order to find the, the center of mass of it. So in the next video, I'm going to do um, an example of, calculate, of using the integral to calculate the center of mass of an extended object, let's say a rod.